Good afternoon, and thank you for uh, inviting me to give this presentation on how do we get past all of the problems that we tend to have using traditional wiring methods. We, we've soldered, we've crimped, um, we've been doing punch downs, and aside from the technical considerations of that, there are business reasons that we want to look at perhaps first for why do we try to build without using any of those traditional methods. Uh, the first is uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics shows us that uh, about 2% out of approximately 29,500 uh, communications taxes or radio and TV tax, about 2% of that workforce is out with some form of non-fatal injury at any point in time. Uh, especially in smaller stations, yeah, that may be the only engineer, it's not 2%. If that person is injured, that, that's 100% you may not have your engineer or maybe an assistant. Uh, some of the things we do, soldering and some of the solvents and stuff that we use, can have long-term health effects long after we've left an employer. So there, there, are, there are various reasons, uh, health and safety reasons. Uh, soldering was considered a, a workplace risk just because you've got this heated device that you might forget to turn off. Um, and thanks to Kirk, I put the picture up there of how to, how to use the soldering iron the wrong way. Um, <laughs> there are, well, yeah, I don't even notice. Um, so we, we have a, a, a variety of reasons. Uh, beyond the health and safety reasons, the, the next business reason is we're looking to get things done perhaps faster, better, cheaper. Now, we all joke about how we should have plugs and wheels on everything in broadcasting. But that's true of the wiring. Now, we, I'm sure all of us have seen at some point a string of six or eight adapters that represents every time a CD player or a cart machine or something was changed and we couldn't interrupt the, the wiring, we couldn't turn the console off, we couldn't unplug the other end of it, so we made an adapter. And I think a string of eight adapters and probably weighing two or three pounds hanging in the back for every device in the rack. The IT world has started, and has used for a long time, structured wiring. A common wire running for everything, and how you use that, whether it's for IP data, or, or audio, or control, or whatever, depends on what you plug in at, at either end. We, we can do the same thing. I can tell you from experience that it, it works. Uh, I've built, um, Unshielded twisted pair cabling next to 50 kilowatt ANs and that'll work just fine. You do have to do the wiring the correct way. You're generally going to be using more modern electronics. Uh, th these, these are all based on, on standards. And major broadcast networks are relying on it. The stock market relies on it. Your emergency communications rely on it. The, the emergency world has been slower to adopt it, maybe in some other uh, industries. But there are many reasons to look at using a, a disciplined approach to structural wiring. Pull the same type of cable that is used in the plant. You, whether you go to your IT department or maybe that's you as well, you go to the same vendor that is pulling your wiring in the offices. You know, if, you're, if you're pulling maybe a couple hundred drops to the offices, it's not that big a change to add in the few drops that we may need in new studios. And I would generally recommend about 12 uh, cat six or so uh, drops per room. You can take that, that whole process of getting the wiring then you give it to one vendor instead of multiple, you're pulling one type of cable. It, it becomes much easier, whether it's the fire marshal or some other inspecting official, if you're trying to meet local codes, fire codes, electrical codes, going to this type of system has benefits beyond just the technology. I put a couple of the, some of the reasons for, for adopting this. Um, one of the things that uh, you know, we were discussing this yesterday, if you've been doing this long enough, you probably have $3,000 worth of crimp tools of some kind in your bag and you're using them now maybe once or twice a year. 
from the structured wiring system, uh, if you're doing your own punching on the panels, okay, you've got a 110 punch tool, and you may have an RJ45 tool. But you can also buy pre-terminated bundles. There are several companies that offer them. They give you typically six connections of whatever length, terminated in RJ45s or a plug or jack at either end. We don't have to be doing those repetitive motion injury type things of, of punching down and crimping necessarily anymore. We, we don't have to, we can do almost everything from the microphone to the input of the transmitter can be done with a pre-made cable that will perform uh, flawlessly. Uh, the problem comes in, in we have a, a difference now in how how we choose the products we're using in, in the plant. It used to be that you went to the Sony or Pacific Recorders, Gates Air, whatever, Grass Valley. You said, I want your system, and they told you how to wire it, and you bought a bunch of wire, and you sat there for a couple of months wiring it. We don't, as we move to a networked plant, and we really, we don't even care whether it's Cisco or Extreme or whoever switches, doesn't really matter. As we move to a network plant, the network standard that you choose is what's going to determine the equipment you're attaching to. So you're going to have, uh, whether it's NDI video, ST2110, Dante, Livewire, whatever, the technology that you're going to choose to build your plant is going to determine the various products that you attach. Those then become ubiquitous. We don't really care what the wiring is. We're just going to put a patch cord at either end uh, whether we're connecting it to a switch or not, or we're connecting it between two devices. But these are all common items. You can buy a pre-punched patch panel to put in various keystone jacks. Some of those panels will also hold a BNC, so you can have your video and monitor wiring in the same pretty arrangement as the rest of your cabling. Uh, you can buy any manner of pre-terminated fiber. In some cases, fiber will be cheaper than copper especially as you get into higher multi-channel uh, systems. All of these things are, are very off the shelf. Some of them are readily available even despite our current uh, shortage of things. Now, using, let me show back up to this one here. Using the, uh, the bundle shown in the center there, pre-made CAT6 cables, you can take uh, say one 24 port panel and, and four of those for each of three racks and in, in, in a few hours, three or four hours, you can have all your wiring done between a bunch of racks rather than traditional multi-pair methods or even single pair going up and over a cable tray and pulling another wire at a time. You do a patch bay from every rack to a common rack and then you're just doing drop cables in the racks as you make changes rather than always pulling another wire going up a ladder Whatever. Um, That's running a BNC on a Cat 6 cable? Is that I'm, I'm sorry, didn't you? Is that what that connected BNC to? BNC on a Cat 6? No, no, the, 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 the BNC, I'm mainly showing that because it, you can use the same physical infrastructure to, you can put a BNC in that punched panel and have your, oh, your video wiring coming to the point, same place point. as your other. Oh, okay. So if you're doing a small deployment, you, you don't have to be drawing a panel or buying yet another product. This becomes very they had, um, homogenous, I guess. Radio World had a picture of an RJ45 plug to a BNC on the cover mm -hmm. a few months ago. And I thought it was a joke at first, but apparently that's adapted or does exist. No. I didn't realize that you could run BNC type. Well, I don't think they were running RF per se. But right. it, it depends on what you're running. Because, you know, Twist Cat 5 can run. Three megahertz or so, maybe yeah. more, maybe less. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can carry some RF. I just thought it was a joke. Or, yeah, barely. Yeah. Well, if it's, it's got a 110 volt core on one end and a, and a BNC, uh -huh. that's a joke. Yeah. 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 I mean, if the, if the cable is, is specified to 150 megahertz, it's probably going to pass something in the 100 megahertz range. Sure. Yeah. Is, um, that the is that the difference between 5D and 6? Because I, I don't know if I'm an expert on networking. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the question. Uh, I agree. Is 5E versus 6, is it just the frequency difference, or what's the um, distinction? The, the higher you go in the cable spec, the, the higher the frequency range you can handle with the higher. 
The problem is, is you go too high, you can start having problems at the lower frequencies, uh, especially if you're trying to run AES or some of the video extender products won't run very well on the higher cable because they're looking to pass something close to the baseband. So like for AES 67, can 5 or 6 works just a, Yeah, yeah. For, for AES 67, well, so AES 67 is a, is a packet standard versus AES 3 being a, a, a low band. The AES 67, if you're using most of the products out there, they're only running at 10 megahertz or so, uh, 10 megabit or so. That will work just fine. Um, but if you, sh the, the issue that you may run into is, especially if you have older cabling, is just the, the quality of the installation. Is it going to support the, the data rate? Even at a low data rate, we're still worried about latency. But a well installed piece of CAT5 is still going to perform better than a piece of CAT6 that somebody thought they needed to put a wire tie in six inches and crush the jacket. And I, I have been to facilities where they were, they were beautiful. All the wire was Z folded in 90 degrees, and I had to cut all of it and replace it because it was interfering uh, with either a copper signal or a fiber signal. There, there is a method to, uh, I think there's plenty of resources on the web for the proper way to install cable in. If you're putting 90 degree bends in things, you're going to have a problem. How are the frequency and what pain has to get under this device? After too many years in this business, the higher the frequency, the tighter the twist. The higher the frequency, the tighter the twist of the wire. Yeah, well, yes. but. But it's not the same twist. The twists vary across the four pairs. And that's sort of the secret to how we get the common mode performance out of the cable. There's, there's a variation that reduces the crosstalk between them. And so when you're, if you're mixing standards in a plant, like maybe you're using Studio Hub, and that has the orange and green pairs, but then you go and buy an intercom product from somebody in Europe that is using the blue and uh, brown pairs, you may, if you're doing a long enough run, you may start having issues if you just patch your red and green to the other pair, because you're, you're not following the, the pattern of the twists through the cable. I can't say that you always have a problem, but, um, so yeah. Something. Higher data rates, yes, but I, what we're doing for the most part, no. Now, is that going to change for the video guys as they're doing SD2110? Well, we, we don't know yet. Um, you know, we're already seeing requirements, even the Dante folks will tell you, just move, move to fiber and, and just stop using copper. And um, certainly that will be true for TV and, and probably for radio at some point. In, in, in many cases, fiber is cheaper than copper. And you don't have a ground path that can give you issues, uh, especially if you're in a multi story building. In fact, there's a lot of benefits to fiber, besides the fact that it's supposed to be good for you. Um, <laughs> now, when, when we started all this, uh, Dan Raverman in the studio of ours was, was sort of a leader in doing this in the radio area. We only had a very few adapters. And so some people were not happy with the system because. You ended up buying a lot of large adapters, a lot of bulky cables to make this work. This is this has moved on from there. We now have short adapters. There's three or four different companies making uh, compatible products for the wiring, and especially audio, we can use a lot of very simple and, and cheap things sometimes to build our own networks, or versus having to buy you know, boxes of stuff from from one vendor. Uh, all the usual rules of taking care of a piece of cable because it's a piece of transmission line apply. Watch your beds, you know, the, the quality of how well you screw something down if you're using screw, screw down adapters of some sort. I use a lot of the adapters in the middle, especially if I'm transitioning a place from some sort of traditional wiring to a new automation system. I may want to keep things running in parallel. 
depending upon when you bought some of the various products, they may have input and output connectors in parallel in the back. Maybe they've got RJ45s and DB25s. In some cases, those are looped through or in parallel, and you can use the structured wiring in those products to keep your existing system operating in parallel with something new. Take the source from the old automation, loop it through the device and keep it running where it used to go, and still have your IP data for, for your new network. This doesn't have to be all done at 2 o'clock in the morning anymore. We can do this faster, better, cheaper, or smarter. Um, I make a lot of use out of the DB25 to XLRs. But if you look at the difference in price, that DB25 to XLR snake is, carries eight channels and can cost you $55. I can do that same thing with you know, uh, some of the, the, the breakout products that are down to 35 or something, or even if that's all on IP, I, I've got it on a $6 patch cord. You know, I, I have taken out, in one case recently, we took out in every studio, eight runs of 25 pair, and we replaced them with two Cat 6s. One to the console, and the other to a, 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 a node. Some of the places are getting a little more sophisticated. And the Studio Hub isn't even the first one to do it. Uh, some of the pro audio world, the folks running Maddie and 24 channel systems, they've had a variety of breakout panels for a while that incorporate maybe a DB25 and they incorporate Maddie on a BNC on a fiber. Uh, there are lots of ways of doing this at high density rather than having multi pair cables. And here we've got we've got uh, Angry Audio's breakout. We have a Telos X node, but now we're seeing products that broadcast tools incorporate the RJ45 and usually the Studio Hub wiring standard uh, as third-party products that have nothing to do with with the with the with the network standard. They have nothing to do with audio over IP or any of the major vendors. That these are third-party products in between that meet the wiring standard. One is the Wheatstone blade. I put the Avio in there as well, the Avio adapter, because you can use you can use Dante products in some of these things, uh, even though it's pro audio. Don't they use Wheatnap or Wheatstone? Is that Wheatstone Wheatnap? Yeah, Wheatstone Wheatnap. Yes. Oh, you said Dante. Sorry. Yeah. Well, but the no on the bottom is the um, Dante's little thing. Oh. You know, I, I have done in my little lab. I have put. Uh, Talos products, Wheatstone products, the emerging technology, Revena stuff, and Dante all on the same network. And Do they all talk to each other? They will all talk to each other at AES 67. Usually the thing that you have to be most careful of is who is providing the clock. Because the little Dante Avia will only clock about 20 devices. And if you start trying to have too many streams running, you're, you're going to have a problem. So you may have to choose one of the other devices to be a master. But uh, the merging stuff in the middle is there more because it shows a box that will do a high density of connections with very few connectors. You could plug a DB25 to RJ adapter on there and essentially hubify that box if you wanted to, or plug on a DB25 to XLR. Um, there are many ways to do this using off-the-shelf products, using pre-made cables. Uh, you may make up some adapters of your own as well as you want. Um, you know, also in the studio range, a lot of pre-made adapters of various types. Um, they're not the only ones doing that. You know, in the video world, we also see things, a uh, little bit in the black magic and, and the nausea world of things that are starting to be network or problem solvers. This is this is this picture is why we go to structured wiring. This was apparently like this for 15 years. They had a mic processor on the insert point of a console, and the mic processor died. They brought another processor and it didn't have the same connectors. So they twisted the wires together and shoved them into furniture. And then one day they hired a jock with long legs and stretched underneath the counter and they lost them. 
the uh, mic one, the operator mic in the studio, and uh, I got a call, I went up there, and that's what I found. Because they didn't have any way of changing the connectors while everything was in use, so they twisted the wires together. But if they had had a structured system, they would have just unplugged a little dongle device, an adapter at each end for whatever connector that was. Uh, the, the adapters are, depending upon which one you buy, they're 12 bucks, 16 bucks, 20 bucks. What is your time worth? And if you have a, bun a bunch of this sort of stuff sitting in a box and you have an emergency and you're not there, you might be able to walk the receptionist through making a, a jumper in case, you know, whatever. There's a, there's a, you got a morning show, and there's some musical act they want to get on that's in town. They can pull them in the studio. You can make a very quick cable to plug a mixer into the console, or maybe a hurricane took the roof off the building. You can plug a few cables together and maybe get something back on the air without having to have the tools or even the training in some cases to, to make various cables. This will also help us attract engineering talent. We can bring people in who, for whatever reason, aren't interested in learning all of that health and safety reasons, but they've seen some of it. They've seen patch cords and things. And this makes it easier to train people and, and maybe even to retain them. Um, let's see what else I had in here. That's, that's a quick version of the presentation. And I'm, I'm open to you know, Hey, Ed, I, I, I think that exactly what you said about talking to a uh, secretary, receptionist, salesperson, or even a morning disc guy. Yes. through making a change when all they got to do is get the right RJ connector, move it from one place to another to restore or bypass whatever needs bypass. I've done that at stations in my station in Mississippi and Hawaii and American Samoa. So, it, it, yeah, it's, it's too long for me to travel just to do that. <laughs> you know, we, I, I, have done, I have done that. I've also, um, something you can do if you're, you know, if you're chiefing multiple plants, this gives you something that is predictable and repeatable and, and reliable and scalable. You, you can you take your measurements, you know how many 25 foot patch cords you need, how many 50 foot patch cords, how many adapters. You can build a budget in a spreadsheet and then as you do different projects, you just check off the amounts that you need. You, even if you have something left over, it's, it's, not, it's not a waste because you can apply it to another job. Whereas, I mean, I've seen places where they had 100D connectors still in a sealed bag that they're never going to use. Because they were buying a lot of supplies for a particular project, and the next project didn't use D connectors on the audio, it used XRs. The folks who are using XDS receivers, especially in the public radio world, now, we got rid of four, D20, four D9s and two D37s on the back, and they're now doing it all on one you know, Cat5 and uh, Livewire or AES 67. You can, you can, I had actually one station I did. I walked the traffic girl through replacing one of the receivers. And the other one I did when I got there. Because it, they, they didn't have the time or the money or whatever. They didn't plan ahead. Um, the stuff is reliable. Hey, and even know, though you might use a contractor to pull the wire through the, yes. through the building yes. and, and, and bring it out somewhere, uh, do you or do you hire the contractor to punch it into your RJ45 patch base? Depends upon the locality, so to speak, sometimes. In, in some areas, you're going to run into union issues of what you can. Uh, my preference is to terminate everything in a keystone, and then your furniture shows up. You do a big, like, one foot by one foot hole in the furniture. You shove them through, and you patch, plug it into the patch panel. So one of the advantages you can... We're used to having to do all the wiring after everybody else is done and, and then sit there and put all the connectors on or punch it down. And it gets in the way of finishing the project. Doing something like, and then we do, we'll have the regular wiring contractor who's doing the rest of the studio, who's doing the rest of the building, pull the same wire everywhere. We could do that at any point in the project. Just roll it up, stick it in a bag so dust and whatever doesn't get into it. Then when your furniture shows up, and maybe you've pre-wired that somewhere, you, you slide it in, you, you shove the connectors in the bag through the furniture, you connect them into a pre-punched panel, um, it could be a rack mount panel, or it could be what some people call a monument or a biscuit holding the jacks, and you, you plug your stuff in. You could pre-wired everything somewhere else even, and have the RJ45 just ready there to unroll and plug in. 
That's why I call it sort of a disciplined approach. You have to look at how you're doing this rather than treating it as sort of a onesie twosie thing. Do it as, as, as a system. What's the, and this is more kind of a tangential thing, but AES 67, is that, that's the standard? AES 67 is. And then Wheatnet and Dante are like deviations of that standard where they sort of make it proprietary to their equipment? Well, if you don't mind, let me understand because my colleague was on the committee that did all that. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so <laughs> Dante and Livewire were AOIP standards that were invented separately about the same time in the right. early 2000s. Uh, but they didn't talk to each other. They, they had different philosophies. And then along came uh, Ravenna uh, from Europe, and then along came Wheatnet, and they were all, you know, they were all audio, linear audio in packets, but the, the, the other bits that describe it were, were different. And so uh, uh, we all got together and said, let's have, at least have a way to talk to each other if we have to, yeah. right? And so the AES uh, uh, you know, looked, looked over that, and, and everybody, every proponent, had to change something. It wasn't just live wire stamp with AES 87, although it kind of was. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I think we had to change the lease at, at Telos. But we all had to do something slightly different. And uh, everybody had a different clocking scheme. So we decided to use the big uh, uh, precision time protocol for the mm -hmm. PTB V2 as the clocking scheme. And so that's what became AES 67 in uh, 2014? 2013. 2013. September of 2013. And now September 11, 2013. What a day. It was, it was, it was actually, it wasn't 9 11. Yeah. Um, uh, so anyway, but, so and AES 67 uh, then got. A subset of it got incorporated into SP2110, you know, for, for generally for television. Yes, uh, it's actually kind of a subset of AES67. Uh, from a practical point of view, AES67 is useful, but it typically involves some typing, some moving little files around. Uh, whereas WeedNet, uh, Dante, Livewire, those are all pretty simple. You point and click and click and click and click, <laughs> and, and, and you're done. So there um, are tools so, translating between them. Yes, 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 yeah, absolutely. There's tools for translating between them. So it's, it's just kind of like a glue. I mean, in other words, don't plan on building, I don't know, build my facility on AES 67. Well, you can, but you're going to be typing a lot. Whereas if you, if you build your system with WeedNet or Livewire or Dante, and then you say, oh, when I need to connect these two devices, they both speak AES 67. Yeah, then just get those well, out. We had a conference, Access Multidrag, that I was trying to convert to a I ended up talking to Telos about it, and it was supposed to have been plug and pray, but it didn't quite work the way it did, and we had to manually configure it. To well, see. you may be talking about the codex side, but not the not well, the AOIP yeah. side. Yeah, it was something. You're talking about the multi rack specifically? You're talking about the Comrex multi rack. Yeah, the well, access, Excuse me, access. So, I, to, to back up a little bit on it, don't confuse AES 67, which is a, a packet data standard, with AES 3, which is our our audio so two channel for most part. Three is three AES 50. Three, so, so the, what I find happens a lot is that people, because we can run AES 3 over this as a copy <laughs> path, or we could run it as packet data. They get the AES 67 and the AES 3. Somewhat confused. AES 67, you, you don't have to have a Dante chipset or a Livewire chipset or anything really to, to, to use it. There are products that have AES 67 natively that will talk to other products that at least can accept it. Is it sort of like the CPIP protocol online, or no? Or I'm using that too? It, it, sort of, it would depend upon what, you're, what, what the rest of the network has. Yeah, and uh, AES 67 yeah. is like all the other AOIP standards. It's not TCP IP, it's just not guaranteed. Oh, I didn't get that packet. Right. Can you send it again? Is it no, like that's that's that definition kind of. AES 67 is a UDP it, uh, user data program protocol, and it's, and it's typically multicast, although it can be unicast. AES 3, or also known as AES EBU, yes, that's digital, but nothing else can live on the wire. Yeah, that's a continuous carrier. Yeah, that, that's a continuous stream. That, that's a piece of wire that does that oh, does one thing. thing about point to point with AES EBU. Well, EBU. Yes. Yeah, AES EBU takes up the entire wire. Nothing else yeah, can live on the wire. You can send it over to or... Yes, exactly. Yeah, for, for TV, yeah, it's yeah, on yeah. coax, for radio, it's typically on twisted pair. 
whereas ads 7 is a packetized data uh, AOIP system whereby it can live on there with people doing FTP, browsing the web, making point phone calls, it's, it's all, it's networked. Whereas ads EBU or ads 3 that standard's been around for 20 plus years, yeah. 30 years almost, and, and that's just, it's just for, it's for an analog wire. Uh, it's interesting to get over that twisted pair instead of analog. Twisted pair, not network. Right. But yes, and you know, that but no, the AES3, you've got to have something converted to packet data to become AES67. Yeah. There isn't, it's not, there isn't a compatibility yeah. between them. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You know, there, there are two different things, even though they both say AES. Um, and now we have, and there are multiple AES wiring schemes now that incorporate RJ45s and such, just to confuse it even more. So we have some art, we have AES wiring standards, and we have AES data standards, which three or 67 would be data standards versus the wiring standard. If, like the Comrex access is an interesting one, because as far as I know, there is no, they haven't chosen anybody's chipset per se. There's not Dante or Livewire or Ravenna or anything. Or right, or 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 um, but it is an AES 67 box. You can buy whoever's, uh, I know they, in some of their notes they specify using the Telos X node as a master clock. It's being used as a clock. It has nothing to do with using Livewire with it. It's just to generate that local clock. I, from experience, I can tell you that you can only have one master clock if you have competing master clocks. Things are not going to work properly. Essentially, yeah. The, yeah, that's, that's the, the man with two watches. The the so this is another one of those where we have to be careful of how we're using the word clock versus the word sync because unlike traditional clock or sync that is usually one way we've got a master and it talks to a bunch of something down the down the line and, and typically that's a gen lock. The clock that we're using in AES sixty seven or Ravenna, or Dante, or Livewire, or any of those requires an actual handshake, the same way as everything else in the, in the TCP uh, world does. Now, how how far down the ladder you, you, you go with that, and it depends upon how your system is, now, uh, is architected. Now, I'm just simple, one switch, but I had to, I had to make Dante, uh, I had to make uh, an RTS intercom system talk to Ravenna. So I had to use uh, Dante controller to patch it, and then and then revert it to to AES to translate the, the announcement protocol. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're, and if it is, I forget to remember who it was now. One one of the vendors out there is I believe has like Dante Domain Manager under the hood to handle this sort of what is AES, what is SD twenty one ten. But what's the matter? Um, saying that, and the, how we get everybody to, to talk to each other, um, at least on the audio, would be the AES. The, the clock itself doesn't, the clock itself should be agnostic. But, but, uh, I, I have the instance of, 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 you know, the clock has a priority, two different priorities in the clock. So uh, if, if you have, I, I have a system where I couldn't control the priority of the clock on one source, uh, but I could on the others. And when I had multiple clock sources um, from from Lava, okay, um, some things would connect, some things wouldn't connect, and yes. disconnect. And so I ended up and finally figured out that I've got one of the sources. That, that's going to depend to some degree, and actually probably to a very large degree, on the choice and configuration of, of network switches. At least the Everts folks and the Tektronics folks are doing a pretty good job of trying to come up with the, the ultimate master clock that has all the signals you need out at a rather high price. And there's a tool from a company called Mindbird that's free software. You can you can get it and snoop on snoop on the clocks. And it's really handy. Yeah. I really have to get to see what that is because I you know, the, the whole topic of ETB clock is really interesting because you can have an ETB grandmaster that's yes. synced to GPS, 
But if you've got a big, big facility, uh, then you've got so much network traffic, all these devices asking the clock what time yes. is it, and measuring the transit time in the land so this to further precise that. So now you've got switches that are capable of, right. of, of regenerating the clock themselves. Yes. So not every request goes back to the Grand Master. Because you so, can't. It would take up almost, would take up way too much bandwidth and cost congestion if everybody's trying to go back. So you're supposed to have the grandmaster and the boundary clocks and the transparent clocks, and some switches will regenerate that in, in different ways. And uh, honestly, Cisco is not the switch for the most part to be using. There are others, uh, a, a rest of them will make better switches than, than Cisco for some of this. Because for whatever reason, a lot of this seems to have. Have been developed more in Europe than here, and, and we've we've incorporated. You know, it's become very ubiquitous. Everybody gets along. You know, we have these plug fests where everybody shows up and tries to see if they can outdo each other, and, and then we do these, these wonderful little videos showing everybody talking to each other. Um, clock issues really probably would need to be reviewed with the switch vendors. The other thing that can get you in trouble, especially on older computers, the clock when you're into a computer. Is not talking to the software. The PTP clock stops at the neck. Your timestamp is when it left the physical interface and when it got back to the physical interface. If your NIC is not compatible with PTP, the software, or even if the software will recognize it, you're, you're not going to see that timestamp correctly through the, through the box. Okay. Say yes and no. And the problem is what, what we're doing tends to be a very small subset of what it is. So, you know, if you go into your typical plant, you're going to see uh, white, uh, tan, gray, some of those cables, blue, tends to be used throughout the plant. Um, your yellow and orange tend to be reserved for Wi Fi stuff or even for fiber. Red is theoretically something for crossover cables. I've been using purple for a long time because when we first started A, yes, it was purple cable. Um, I used green because I did a lot of wide orbit when it was Google. So it's, there are standards to some degree for fiber, but not for not for cat five structure. The good news is you can set your own standard. The bad news is you can set your own standard. <laughs> yes. Uh, but I, I was at a plant recently where if it was critical to on air, it was red. They used red cable for everything. Unfortunately, at my small stations with lack of budget and random cable, it, it's, it starts out one thing and then eh, yeah. I, I ran out of that cable, so it's got to be so bad. So I, I, I like red for don't pull on this because it's going to take something off. So the thing is, is because the cable itself doesn't really tell you what it's doing anymore. Because there's whatever can be running over it. It's more important to keep track of how you have your switch programmed in the way of access ports and trunk ports than it is what cable you've got really plugged into that. Um, that uh, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble plugging a 24 channel audio driver into a trunk port that's connected to a PC and flooding your network. Well, now you just brought a trunk port, and that, and that is the main difference there access ports versus trunk ports. And that is the one thing that really needs to be delineated. Now, you may have uh, uh, VLAN ports and stuff like that. At my facilities, I don't, I, I haven't been bothered with that level of right. differentiation, I should, but I, obviously access and trunk ports are not compatible. And so what happens is if you if you have your access ports and they are theoretically running IGMP snooping and all, you prevent the packets that you don't want flooding your devices. And we don't turn that on on the trunk port because we want to pass all the data. So if you plug something into a trunk port that is designed to be on an access port, I had this happen recently with two wide orbit servers. And I could, it took about 15 minutes to shut the place down by the time it populated everything. Because nothing was telling me, no, I don't want that stream. So you had uh, two 24 channel drivers, 24 in each direction, you know, what, 96 channels of, of multicast that, that didn't need to be there, being seen by everybody because the manager wasn't working. And that's, that's another, it's not a structured wiring problem, but 
uh, the folks in IT, and it's different than what we tend to think of, they tend to like just plugging everything into the switch and then going to the management and choosing what VLAN and what type of port. They tend to be very agnostic. So even, you know, you could spend a lot of time if you don't have a, a, an approach to this, trying to find the, the wrong cable that got plugged in somewhere. And the lights on the jack aren't going to tell you very much either in some cases. If it's a managed switch and it doesn't like the data, it shuts the port off, you think there's nothing plugged in there or it's not working. No, the, the switch, the management shut that port off. So you have to unplug it and let it reset, plug it in and see what happens. And what's your typical rule of thumb for, uh, let's say your wiring studio is going to have a 10 AOIP device that need to be on the AOIP network. Would you ever tend to put a, an AOIP approved switch in that room and then have just one cable come back? Or would you start, home, would you home run everything back to a central wiring area? The, the answer is it depends, right? It's, it's, it, it depends upon the level of sophistication that you want to the plant. There are some, and I, I used to be more of the put a switch everywhere and then bring everything back to a common switch. In larger plants, you absolutely have to do that because there's, there's too many other factors in, in you may, oh, CBS or whatever it is, Odyssey in, in Philadelphia. We have three switches that are all just trunk ports because there's so much running. And then those are dropped to switches in each in each of the larger studios. For the most part, if your runs are under 300 feet, it's generally cheaper, faster, better to just do everything to a common location and have two switches. But if you think you're gonna start doing creative stuff, you're gonna have three or four computers in the room, two or three phones running your voice over IP system, and you wanna have main and backup connections and such. And if you've got the time to program the switches, you know, this. Aside from the wiring side, as everything is becoming more data intensive, not only might you spend one day a week at the transmitter, but you're going to spend one day a week managing your network, and I'm not even including the office network. Making sure that you've got your backups and, and your updates, and, and, and you know, go through your switch and look if, if your multicast parameters have changed. You know, maybe somebody plugs something in and you don't even realize it. You could be having a, a problem elsewhere, someone's complaining about well, whatever latency in the audio did because if somebody plugged something in, you need to realize that maybe it's not putting a lot of load on the network, but whatever its interaction with the switches could be a problem. So there are rackets and doing a whole other thing. You can easily spend one day a week managing your critical broadcast network. And with any other question? Um, I don't know if that can the last slide. So here's me if anybody wants to. Here's the contact info. Thank you.